Welcome everyone to DevConf 18 DSA BOF. Uh, we have about 50 minutes together, 45 minutes together. Uh, we'll do a presentation at the beginning, roughly 20 minutes or so. Uh, and then at the end, we can have as many questions as you want to field and we'll try to answer even half of them. So this is our agenda for this presentation. We'll talk about the delegation, membership, looking back, moving forward, uh, requests that we have for some other teams and then a uh, question and answer period at the end. Uh, my name is Luca Filipposi. I'll introduce my colleagues in a moment. Um, I just wanted to remind people that we are a delegated team from the DPL. So our delegation is consists of the following activities. We maintain the Debian user database. It's currently in an LDAP, could be anywhere else, but it's the user database of Debian developers. We administer the infrastructure and support of Debian services. So anything that is a Debian.org is administered by us. We manage some of those services ourselves, for the most part. Um, we manage some of those services ourselves. So the authentication, authorization, email, uh, DNS, content delivery networks, some of the mirrors, and a bunch of other TLAs. Those are administered directly by us. And of course, we coordinate with hosting and service providers. Much of our equipment is not uh, held in a Debian data center. There is no Debian data center. It's hosted by a variety of hosting providers, typically universities, but also ByteMark, for example, in, in the UK. And finally, we work with you to support your services uh, that you run on the DSA managed infrastructure. So who are we? We are currently eight people. We were nine people at the last meeting. Um, currently here with us are five uh, at the conference, four of whom are in the room. My name is Luca Filipozzi in the front row. I'm Tolev, for you have. I'm Paul Wise. And then in the fourth row. I'm Hector. That's Hector. Hector is also one of the DevConf organizers. Uh, not available to us today is uh, Martin Zobohelas. And then three people are not here at the conference uh, today. Julien Cristal, Peter Palfreder, and Aurelien Jarno. And in fact, those three do the bulk of the work. The rest of us help out, but uh, it's, it's those three that do the bulk of the DSA work. And I would, go, uh, rem I would be remiss if I didn't thank Stephen Gran. So Stephen was a DSA for many years, and he stepped down uh, between the last DevConf and this one, and we thank him for his service. <laughs> so uh, looking back, uh, it's been a busy year for standard service requests. As you know, we uh, do that through RT, and we have had a pile of them this year. I won't go into them. They're just the standard kind of thing. Uh, but it's also been an extremely busy year for interacting with other teams. So we've been working with the Debian Secure Boot team, assisting with the secure signing infrastructure so that when uh, kernels that have secure boot features need to be signed, they get signed in the appropriate way and in a secure manner. We've been working with the Debian Cloud team. Uh, we deployed a new CD build image server called Casulana and other related infrastructure. And we really hope that this is the year that we see it being used for the building of all of the cloud images. Right now, it's only doing OpenStack and the, and the CD images themselves. Uh, we've been working closely with the DevConf team, both global and local, to move some of the existing services uh, and adding new ones in support of DC18 so that they're not on DevConf infrastructure, but on Debian infrastructure. Uh, and finally, we've been working with the Debian Mirror team to bolster the monitoring of mirrors and to delist defunct mirrors or mirrors that are chronically, uh, chronically out of sync because we want the user experience to be a good one. And it's great that universities and others, hosting providers are offering mirrors across the world, but they're not as useful, those mirrors, if they're, out of, if they're stale and out of date and users are referencing old material. And it's, that's one of the reasons why the security mirrors can may continue to be something that we manage directly with a small number of mirror sites around the world. And lately, behind uh, Fastly's or Mac CDN, one of the two, um, content delivery networks. And that way, we can uh, ensure timely delivery of security updates uh, to our user community. Um, we've not done a lot of infrastructure refresh over the last year. Uh, the biggest one really was uh, a new to us uh, storage array at Sanger in the UK. 
So Welcome Sanger has uh, always been generous to us. They have an enormous HPC with a huge amount of storage. They do a lot of uh, drug interaction testing, I guess. And they're, when they do a, a storage refresh, they often make that storage available to us. Extremely handy for snapshotsdebian.org. So we keep snapshots of all of the packages that go out, not just the, uh, the point releases. And if you've ever been to snap, never been to snapshots.debian.org, I encourage you to go, and that's how you can go and find uh, that one package that, whoops, that one package that has gone away. Uh, you can still kind of try to find it uh, through the snapshots. Other service changes that we've deployed, uh, sec both Security Tracker and Security, are behind a content delivery network. Um, security Tracker is actually a bit of a funny one. Uh, whenever I move my head in a particular way, I lose audio. I'll just, I'll just not move. Um, the uh, security tracker, I forget the name of the software package that was uh, modified to pull down uh, a variety of CVE sources, including Debian CVE source, and it had a bug, which was that every time you, uh, every time one of those CVE sources uh, came back with a 404 or something, it went and refetched all of the CVE sources to the point that it was hitting us uh, every time that it ran this thing. I, an unnamed company, not represented here or on the back of my t-shirt, deployed this as part of their cloud, um, uh, their cloud image test uh, cycle. So I think what they do is their user community can upload a VM image to their uh, testing portal and it runs this thing. So they had thousands of machines all running this testing framework, all hitting uh, Security Tracker, which was a poor little machine sitting at MIT, and we completely trounced it. So we moved in behind a content delivery network. Very thankful to MacCDN for allowing us to do that, uh, and we mitigated that load, at least temporarily, and then we got in contact with the vendor, and we uh, got them to mitigate a little bit of the load by reducing their node count, and, uh, and now we're talking about how we can fix that bug so that the people, other people who've deployed it because it's an open source project uh, can also start hitting our, our security tracker less. But it's the unintended kind of thing, you know, completely out of our, out of our control and ca caused us a huge amount of uh, load. And that's why it's important for us to have uh, s service providers that are able to scale to, uh, to meet our needs. So thank you for those uh, people who have donated to DebConf and made this conference possible. I'd also encourage you to think about giving to Debian directly because uh, sometimes we need services, either donated or things that we buy, that we can uh, address the, the loads and the requirements of our users. Um, and we also had a DSA sprint in February. I did not attend that. Uh, we hope to have another one in 2019 probably. Um, it's usually during these DSA sprints that we kind of plan out our four or five year trajectory of our hardware refreshes and our service refreshes. Um, so to that end, uh, moving forward, uh, the biggest refresh this year is likely to be the updated Gennetti cluster at Manda. So we have pairs usually of machines that are operating as Gennetti clusters. All of our services to the, as much as we can are virtualized in VMs. They run in multiple geographic jurisdictions, so Europe and North America. They run on multiple v Gennady clusters, even when they're in one jurisdiction. And we tried to do this to ensure that we have um, no single point of failure, either a legal issue, so that's why EU, United States, or North America, uh, no vendor or hosting provider, single point of failure, so we don't put everything at bite mark, we don't put everything at UBC. Um, no single point of failure on hardware, ideally. We have a lot of HPE equipment, but we're trying to diversify that a little bit. So again, uh, if we have relationships with these vendors, we can go to one or the other, get the best price, but also not suffer um, a situation where the relationship sours or we can't get spare parts or what have you. So we try to achieve redundancies in each of these things including uh, services like uh, content delivery network. So Mac CDN is one CDN partner, Fastly is another CDN partner. DNS, we have some global DNS providers. Uh, again, we have two of them. So in all of these things, we try to achieve some, some form of redundancy. So the Gennady cluster is one of the VM uh, farms. Uh, it's not the only one, but it's the next one being updated. 
Um, we have two other things that we'd like to focus on in the next year. Um, as part of the cloud team effort, we'd like to address the identity and access management aspects. I brought this up at the last cloud sprint. Uh, it'll probably be a topic for the next cloud sprint. And the challenge here is that these hosting providers, cloud hosting providers have offered individuals accounts or we have pseudo Debian accounts. We don't really have an account for Debian proper. It's not signed by SPI as, as the trusted organization. There are probably some indemnification aspects that need to be reviewed. Um, and it's not tied into UBC, and UBC, that's where I work, um, Debian's uh, authentication and authorization infrastructure. So from a DSA perspective, it would be good if we could turn off Luca's account in Debian, but also have Luca's account be turned off in all the places in the cloud where he should no longer have access wearing his Debian, Debian hat. So if I retire or Dam chooses to, uh, chooses to disable my account for some reason, this should turn off in all the places where I gained access as a consequence of being, being a Debian developer. Um, we are advocating for uh, DPL to create a formal cloud team delegation. Um, we think that that's important uh, in order to solidify some of the policy decisions that are being made by the cloud team. For example, all images to the best of our ability should be built on Debian hardware under DSA control, so Casulana. Right now, those cloud images are not built on Castellana. The only ones that are, are OpenStack, but not AWS, not Google, and not Microsoft, and not DigitalOcean. So take your pick. The only one that is uh, on Castellana is, is OpenStack. Um, uh, I just mentioned integrating the Debian authentication and authorization with each cloud provider. Each one is a bit different. Some of them are SAML aware. Some of them are only LDAP aware. Um, either way, there's always going to be some mechanism that we can use, uh, even if it has to be an LDAP sync, in order to, to achieve uh, authentication and authorization uh, coupling. This isn't about uh, DSA taking control. I want to make that clear. This is about empowering the cloud team to manage access to the cloud resources, another reason why there needs to be a delegation to the cloud team so that whoever the delegate is or the team of people that are the delegate, they make the decision about who gains or loses access to cloud resources. Um, we talked at the last DSA, uh, BOF, at the last DebConf uh, about a container service. We've made some progress um, uh, in terms of our own thinking. Uh, Debian itself has made progress in terms of uh, adding container runtimes into into packages. Um, so they're making their way into testing and backports that are unstable, of course. Uh, we, need to, we need to make some progress on this front. We need to decide whether or not we're going to focus on Docker or Kubernetes. Um, it's lagging in Debian, so Kubernetes is uh, interesting uh, and probably the better one, but we need to make significantly greater progress on that front as a community before we can turn it into a DSA managed container service. We need a conversation, therefore, around Docker versus Kubernetes, and we can do that after we finish this presentation if we want. But we also need to include a conversation around vendoring, because there's a lot of stuff inside of Kubernetes that moves quickly, and do we want that to be packaged externally, or can we package it inside of the Kubernetes package uh, so that it makes its way through um, the archive more quickly in terms of releases. So, to our requests, um, he's here in the room, so DPL, please establish a delegation with the cloud team. We can talk about that after. Um, the DI team, uh, we've now been running deb.debian.org for more than two years, I think. It's uh, quite stable. Uh, we would encourage the DI team to consider making deb.debian.org the default re repo during installation, and only if somebody chooses uh, country-specific repo they could change. Um, it is, deb .org is behind a content delivery network, so it's available throughout the world. Um, the apt team, uh, there, are, there are still some issues with content delivery networks um, where if a cache uh, misses, uh, it has to go back to the back end. Sometimes there's hash mismatches. It would be really good if apt itself using uh, um, content security policy report URI directives could uh, cause apt to deliver hash, mi hash mismatch 
uh, reporting back to Debian so we could understand where these hash mismatches are occurring. It would be nice if apt also retried. So when there's a miss and when it doesn't return fast enough, instead of bailing on the first 404, could it retry a couple of times before finally um, working out? I think that would be useful. So the, the report URIs are useful for us on the administration side. The retries are useful on the end user side so that it doesn't just bork uh, on the first 404. And finally, to the cloud team, uh, let's get busy on moving all this stuff to FAI and building under Casolana so that all of the uh, Debian branded uh, cloud images are all uh, built in the same manner on the same hardware that's Debian controlled. Um, finally, uh, going to questions in a moment, but I also have here how to contact us. So we are available in the Debian admin channel on IRC. You can also email Debian admin, typo, uh, no G there, I'll fix that in a minute. Um, uh, that's not just DSA, it's a closed mailing list, but it's not just us, it also includes some hosting and uh, service pro owners, hosting providers and service owners. So if you want to talk to just us, uh, then you should email DSA at Debian.org, and that's just the Debian system administrator. So if you have something of concern that you don't want it to be public to these other people, or you don't want to discuss it in the MIPC, please email us at DSA. If it's a standard type of service request, even if it's an oddball type service request, I should have put it on here, kindly use uh, RT uh, rather than email directly to DSA. Uh, be cognizant then, of course, that depending on where the ticket moves, it might uh, end up in a queue that isn't DSA, it might go to another team for processing, and therefore be cognizant of what you put into the ticket. Okay. So that's about 17 minutes worth of talking. I said it would be 20, so I'm about on time. Happy to field a pile of questions. All four of us are here. Hi. The uh, cloud team delegation, is that blocking on me or do you need to would you like me to write the draft, or you write the draft, et cetera? What's no, it's not blocking on you, since we only just told you about it a minute ago. <laughs> you, just checking. <laughs> uh, but on that. So we've only just been discussing it this week. We haven't even worked out who we'd ask for you to delegate yet. So you know, it's something that we'll be coming to you again with more details on shortly. Awesome. Um, the other thing is the um, you listed a whole bunch of sponsors, like the people supplying the disk space for snapshot.debian.org. I wonder if you could talk briefly about what sort of, I can't think of a better word, but, um, but return these sponsors are seeing on their investment uh, in terms of, I mean, at least in terms of are there their logos on the home pages of these things and beyond that. Um, because I'm sh they're very kind to do it, but also they're doing it for a reason as well, and, and things like that. If you, if you get what I mean there. Sure. I can't so, think of uh, a better way of phrasing that. So, well, some of them are truly altruistic. Um, some of them run Debian infrastructure themselves and want to give back in one way or another. Um, so uh, historically, it's been universities that have offered us both hosting space and uh, in their data centers and bandwidth, and they've typically had uh, excellent bandwidth because they're part of some NREN, National Research Education Network. So uh, Giant in, in the UK, Giant, Giant in the UK, or Net2 in the United States. Um, more recently, we've had companies uh, offering space, like ByteMark. Um, uh, all of them have the opportunity of having their logos or um, some short blurb about what they do to be listed on the Debian Partner site, which is off of www.debian.org slash partners, I believe. Um, uh, Laura and I are on the Debian Partners team. She's much more active than I am. We've been trying to clean up the list of partners to make sure that it uh, continues to be relevant because it had been unmaintained for some time. Um, we've not yet gotten to the point where we have a proposal of what it means, what is the criteria to continue to be listed. Um, so if I think of HPE, for example, who donates to DebConf, um, but does not anymore de donate to Debian, they did, though, donate uh, an enormous amount of equipment, $450,000 worth of equipment in 2016. And so does that mean they only get one year of 
of being on the partner's page, or do we amortize that over the lifespan of the hardware? So we don't have criteria for that, because if I were in HPE's shoes, I would say that maybe I should be on that partner's page for some number of years. Um, on the other hand, we have uh, the DNS hosting providers, which are crucial, um, and they are tier one uh, host, uh, hosting providers, um, uh, where the cost of delivery of that service to us is probably very, very low to them. Um, so the value to us is enormous, but the actual cost of acquiring that service is probably fairly low, nowhere close to 450000 And so what is the criteria for ongoing listing of a service provider of that nature? So Laura and I have ignored that problem a little bit because it is, uh, it is a little bit thorny. Um, at the moment, if you are an active uh, provider of a service or we have your equipment in a data center, that puts you on the partner's page. So if we stop running HP equipment at some point, maybe then that's when the HP logo would go, would go away. Another slightly more visible place we actually put this, at least for hosting and, and hardware donations, is on the machines page on dbw.org, which, because I think that people tend to look at that more often than the partners page. And in general, if, if partners are interested in doing like things like press releases or mentioning us, then you know, we try to be cooperative. Getcha. I was also coming from the other angle of if, I mean, I often speak to a bunch of people very early stages of perhaps potentially thinking of donating and I'm saying, yeah, please do, please, 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 amazing. Then they sort of hunt around for what they would get for that and they see that um, the, the people who are currently sponsoring particularly hardware aren't really asking for that much and therefore, you know, just a little logo and they're fine with that but the people coming in are like, oh, is that all we're gonna get kind of thing? And they don't kind of get excited about that kind of partnership, even though we could potentially offer more, but yeah. So we need to- They're not necessarily asking for anything. And so the question was, what are they asking for? They aren't asking for anything in particular, but when they sort of survey the scene of what currently people are doing, which seems that currently people are happy with what's going on, they don't get excited about it in that sense. So there's a kind of this hidden category of, oh yeah. So, yeah, I've no, I've no ask here. I'm just curious about what the, the current state is, yeah. Well, so I, I mentioned what Laura and I are doing, but we do need input in terms of what, it, what would a package of interest be to an OEM like a Dell or HPE to continue ha sponsoring hardware, for example. Gotcha, cool. Um, one more thing. The, um, there is a bug I filed a few years ago against DI for the Deb org rename, although at the time it was for HTTP reader. <laughs> so that just needs a rename. And yep. then, um, yeah, so. Cool. So again, dev.devin.org is in DI and already is to a certain extent the default, but yes, we should probably improve it. So, um, you know, it's the only one offered unless you want to specifically go and check something else. Yeah, so to be clear, we're not advocating removal of the rest of the country specific oh, list. Sure. And there's always a risk that um, Mac CDN or Fastly stop being a CDN provider. So having the country specific mirrors is important. So, but as long as we have these two CDN providers and deb.debbing.org is stable, I think it's uh, a, nice, a nice way of, of communicating to our users that you don't have to think about that piece of the installer, just breeze through that next screen. I, I guess, like, what would happen if, say, uh, the unthinkable happens and all of our CDN providers say, fuck you, Debian, uh, like, I guess, what would, we, what would we do in that case? We just point deb, debian.org to ftp.us? Would we, like, try to do, okay? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so um, deb.debian.org is just a bunch of SRV records. Right, sure. Yeah. Yeah, I, I just was thinking, I, mean, I don't know, if, like, a cleaner fallback, uh, if you encoded that country information in, uh, I don't know. No. That, that said, if uh, they decide to stop sponsoring us, yep. they would probably also stop sponsoring small sites like PyPy, CPAN, mm. uh, RubyGems, and like basically like the entire open source like in internet hosting would fall away. So um, I'm not like super concerned about that, but yeah, we, and it's, it's part of the reason why we have uh, two different companies sponsoring uh, CDN stuff. So if something goes wrong or, you know, they 
like the relationship hours or whatever, yeah. then we can actually change that. Yeah, and, and to be clear, I I'm, I'm don't think this is in any way likely. I just yeah. thought it was a possibility. Um, so um, entirely unrelated, um, you talked about uh, cloud uh, and IAM, but are is there any work being done on like overall Debian IAM, like? Making our sort of uh, you know, user experience more consistent and more central, like maybe like. So I started a, a use. So what we use is something called user dir ldap and user dir cgi, and I started a rewrite of those several years ago called ud. Uh, got to the point about eighty percent of coverage of user dir ldap. It didn't have the web interface. And then I stopped, um, got irritated at what I was doing and moved on to something else. I should probably resume it. Um, a, a really important question for us to ask though is whether or not what we're doing with LDAP even makes sense because we overload LDAP with a lot of Debian specific customizations, which means that take your pick of product, you can't really use it out of the box with, with our LDAP and is that useful? Mm -hmm. So if what we want is a database, then use a database. Um, uh, and at which point then you could do different things. You could deploy, we could deploy an IDP for SAML or OIDC or things like that. So these are, I don't know that we'll get these solved in times for the next Debian cloud sprint because I think that sprint is where we have the hard conversation about getting people to buy into the idea that this needs to all be kind of centralized under a, under a same, uh, a same, same auth n, auth z kind of infrastructure. And then what do we need to do? Um, so uh, need work is needed. Um, I don't know whether or not uh, UD, the rewrite of user drill up, is the right direction, though. If, if one wanted to get involved with that and it's not a member of DSA, how would, is, like, what would one do? Uh, so I do a lot of identity management stuff at my university. I'd be happy to chat with you. Um, we can talk about what the smart play here is. Um, so uh, I should describe a little bit what user drill LDAP does. Apart from heavy customization of LDAP structure, um, uh, when we were a young uh, distro and we had hosting providers all over the world and machines all over the world, connections weren't very good. And so having live authentication back to some central store did not make sense. So what user drill LDAP does is it really it generates a pile of individual files for it's a user a group, okay, there we go, etc. group, and uh, or for the mail service, or take your pick. It just has piles and piles of these little small files, and then it distributes those files um, to individual machines so that they can act standalone in case uh, network links go, go down. Um, that's probably still useful. We probably don't want to be reliant on their internet connections to be available uh, back to some central source but can we clean up the many separate files so it's one kind of push to each host and on each host it does something a little bit more intelligent. There's like choices to be made here. And that's Luke. And Helen would like to meet with you. Um, okay, that's related. my intro. Nice. Yep. Um, related to that, what's the sort of story for um, you people joining the team, perhaps on the side, um, to helping out in this particular area? Obviously, it's difficult because you might need, you know, pseudos or whatever. But. Yeah, so we, we are like any other delegated team. We recruit uh, ourselves and then we find uh, whether or not that person works out in a pro B fashion. And if it does work out, then we ask DPL to expand the delegation to include that additional person. So um, uh, trust is not transitive. Just because somebody's on the DI team or on the cloud team does not mean that they should be on the DSA team and vice versa. Um, at the moment, we are not recruiting. Um, we could talk about that, given that um, um, one of our colleagues resigned. But so in terms of becoming DSA, uh, get to know us, join, join the channel, uh, participate, start giving ideas, and, uh, and then we can talk about it. But it, we're like any other team, uh, recruitment from inside. Sure, but you would concede it's slightly more difficult because 
um, someone thinking of joining couldn't be running commands on machines whilst they could perhaps be throwing commits at DI, right? Well, there are many of us that wear multiple hats, even inside of the current DSA team. Uh, Julien is a stable release manager. Um, I'm working with the cloud team. Uh, take, your, uh, take your pick. We all are wearing multiple hats. Uh, people that uh, do these additional roles inside of Debian need to wear their hats faithfully. So um, you don't join DSA just because it makes your DI work easier. Sorry, I wasn't saying that. It's just okay. I'm saying that as a um, just comparing the two teams, not not about different hats yeah. at all like yeah. that. But it's sort of easier to contribute as a newcomer to DI than oh, DSA. Yeah, and that's just part of the the game of DSA. That's you, you can't really work around that as it's thingy. But I'm just wondering how one can make it slightly easier. I, might, I, might explain very well. Sorry. Sort of. I, I think that uh, given that DSA has root on every Debian.org machine and it runs all of our infrastructure, um, people that want to become DSA members need to have a demonstrated uh, track record with the organization in a number of different teams, at least one beyond just being a DD uploader, um, and hopefully also have some work experience or some other kind of uh, open source project support experience in system administration. So we're not going to I'm not sure how keen we are on training a system administrator, but if you are working as a system administrator and have done a variety of tasks, then that would be interesting. Okay. I guess are there uh, ways one could say, I don't know, contribute to DSA um, um, config management or that sort of thing to uh, sort of demonstrate that sort of competence? Yeah, so all of, our, all of our stuff is managed with Puppet for the most part. Our Puppet repos, uh, the repos themselves are private, but we have a copy on Salsa. So uh, it is crufty and could use a lot of cleanup. Uh, absolutely people that are experts at Puppet could give us a hand. We had a, a major rewrite of it, which we didn't deploy because it was too big of a patch. Um, so we probably turned that person off a little bit because uh, they were super keen. But it was also too, too big of a risk to apply in one, one fell swoop. So um, having incremental improvements to our Puppet infrastructure uh, to bring us into more conformance with pop, modern Puppet uh, usage would be great. That would be absolutely perfect. Yeah, I've, I've been at least at one organization that uh, tried to go to modern Puppet and ended up switching to Chef. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I think there are various uh, smaller projects where we would be interested in, like, if somebody wanted to to help out with some of our, our monitoring and and metrics scattering, that's something where I think we could uh, improve what we have currently. It's it's Minin and it, and Ishinga, and I mean, it turns out that five minute resolution on graphs is not actually that great. So re replacing that with something more modern would be welcome. But, and it wouldn't actually require that much in terms of access to get it going. So, and, and it's also something where we can run it in parallel. So it's, it's easier for somebody to contribute to something like that than it would be to uh, replace all the authentication where suddenly you're replacing really base bits of, of the infrastructure. Okay, so to complete the kind of introductions of who spoke, we had Piep, Chris, we had uh, Luke, and behind Luke we had um, that guy, Sledge. Anybody else have questions for us? We have 15 minutes left or so. So going through the recent discussion about um, architecture qual um, qualifications for the bust release, um, so DSA did raise concerns about some of the existing build Ds for the on ports in you know, a subject obviously close to my heart. Um, so um, obviously I'll be talking about that in the on ports buff tomorrow and I've been talking to you already about the, um, some of the related stuff. 
Um, where am I going with this? Sorry. Um, it might be nice to have a um, clearer idea of, a, of exactly what DSA consider to be a minimum standard for Build D and for hosted machines. Um, I think I have a reasonable idea, but you know, I've, I've been kind of asserting it and no one's arguing with me, but definitely you know, it would be nice to actually get, to get um, something agreed about about that rather than, you know, so we don't just end up disagreeing and maybe, you know, have a, a surprise later. Yeah. Um, we've, we've written that down before. Um, Talaf's busy searching where we wrote that down. We're happy to write it down again in a more public place if needed. But it sure. basically, the, it comes down to the following. Um, uh, most, of our, most of our hosting providers are not uh, where we have access, right? So none of us live close to Bitemark, for example. I happen to live close to UBC and work at UBC, so the stuff that's there I can maintain, but that's the, that's the exception, not the rule. So we want to make the life of our hosting partners very simple. So that typically means buying relatively, ideally new hardware with, uh, in the HP terminology, uh, an extended warranty or a care pack that includes on-site technician so that the only thing that we need to do with our hosting provider is irritate them to the point of granting access to the HP technician. But otherwise, the machine is maintained uh, on our behalf by HPE. Anything that's not like that means that we need intelligent remote hands provided by the hosting provider so that we can let them know that uh, they need to swap out a hard drive. Okay, that's not that uh, intelligent. All the way up to um, taking apart a, uh, a server or finding an ATX box that can accommodate uh, an ARM board or something like that. So that's why we typically like rack-mounted hardware that uh, comes with it, that is purchasable from a vendor so that we're not reliant on donations only so that uh, something that we can get a warranty for, so that uh, ideally a on-site technician type warranty so that they can come and do maintenance on the device and not have to bother a hosting provider, uh, needs to uh, have some kind of remote uh, management capability either on board or with additional things off board like intelligent power bar or serial console, needs to boot into serial so that we can see what's happening during boot, um, needs to uh, power on successfully after a reboot cycle. Some of these boards don't. Um, so that they really are these remote um, devices that can be managed uh, uh, by DSA without having to bother our hosting provider to go push a button to reset it. So the conversation that we had earlier today, or earlier this week, was could ARM put together a bunch of one-new boxes with the donated boards that you have that meet the kind of specs? Uh, and I said, I think I'd be comfortable with that. I haven't discussed that with my colleagues. But effectively, what that means is that ARM or Lenaro, depending on which hat you do it with, um, becomes the vendor for these boxes, right? And we don't get a Lenaro technician to come and fix it, but we maybe put them in a couple of places where, like ARM and at UBC, where there is somebody close by that can go do something. So we still want that geographic redundancy. Uh, we want the legal jurisdiction redundancy so that it's in Europe and North America. Um, and your upcoming trip to, um, to Vancouver makes for a really good opportunity for you to build a couple of these and bring them by. Exactly, yeah, thanks. Yeah. No, I said, I think I understand that, you understand that. It's just, it's just great to get, the, to get this clarified for anybody else who might not be aware of the discussion. Yeah. Yeah, it, um, if, you, if you view these things through the lens of what is the, uh, how do we minimize the burden on our hosting provider, then the rest of it kind of follows. Yeah, I, I couldn't actually find it documented, so I'm starting to do that actually right now. Okay. Awesome, thanks. So I know we've had discussions about this before, and I think it has been documented, um, but just something that you'd say could be linked from the existing, you know, from the latest round of arch qualification stuff, you know, yep. just makes it easier for people to understand, that's all. Any other questions? So, how are DSA handling mail these days? I know that Steve Gran used to be um, involved and very much, you know, set up a lot of, uh, put a lot of effort in for XM config across all the machines and whatever. What are plans these days? 
Uh, I have been the one doing most of that uh, hacking of data, except config lately. So uh, we don't really have any big plans to change stuff much. It, I mean, it, it's there, it works. Uh, we do want to get, so there, there's, at least last time I checked, there was missing support in XM upstream for various uh, things like Dane and so on, which would be nice to, to get in, but which isn't really, like, it's not about DSA and Debian as such, it's more of a, it would be nice if we followed more of the, the more modern standards. Um, we haven't really, we've kind of ignored the entire SPF DKIM uh, stuff. Uh, I know that Luca looked a little bit at it a few years ago. If there is more interest in that, then it's something we could look more at, but sure. So you know, a follow-up question um, to find, um, is a couple of people have asked me this week how to deal with sending mail from Debian.org addresses. Obviously, lots of us have our own colo boxes and we can just do, do mail and whatever and it just works. Um, of course, lots of newer people who don't have that, um, I'm, I'm told but by at least a couple of people, it's a struggle to get through an ISP or whatever that will let them set form addresses. Um, we've had the, just the question in the past, could we possibly set up at least a limited support smart host you know, or mail forwarding for some of those people you know, to let them actually work at using Debian.org addresses reasonably? Feel, feel free to point those people in uh, my direction because I actually run that as like without any any other hat than like my own. Uh, I run such a service and I'm happy for people to sign up to that. I think several of us run such a service for people in Debian who need this and don't do it themselves. And Steve's point might have been that a more centralized service <laughs> is needed. Yeah, this is a centralized service that people can sign up to. Ah, awesome. I'm glad it exists. I, w I wasn't aware, so um, I'm glad to hear about it. And for the video, that was Stefano that interjected. Okay, six more minutes. We don't have to fill it all in, but happy to field your questions. Ask now or wait a year. Because you'll never talk to us any other way. <laughs> okay, well, if there are no further questions, um, we'll hang out a bit after the session um, and chat with you, but uh, we can call the video presentation to a close. Thank you.